So uh, welcome to Greenfield Community Church. I trust that everyone is doing okay, um, enjoying the sunshine. I know for uh, myself that I really enjoyed uh, getting out, getting on my bike, um, and, and enjoy walking this week as well. Um, so I'd like to welcome you to our stream. I see that we have some visitors uh, from IP address uh, 599 uh, dot 11.77, just a special welcome to you. Okay, that's just a joke. We actually don't track IP addresses of people who are watching uh, the service. Uh, what I do want to say, though, is that if you are, are participating in our worship service in this time, and if you're not receiving our weekly emails, uh, go to our website at greenfieldchurch.ca and sign up for them. You just have to register. There's a link right on the main page, and you can sign up, and then you would be getting uh, all of the information from the church, um, including, uh, you know, regular emails uh, every week that can help you stay informed. <clears throat> now, as we uh, turn to this morning's scripture, we'll be reading from the Gospel of John. And here, I again would like to encourage you to pause uh, the, the video, um, and have someone read from chapter 20, verses 24 to 31 of the Gospel of John. And so go ahead and do that now. And if you didn't want to do that, that's fine, because I'm going to read it for us now. So I'm reading from uh, Gospel of John in the NIV translation, and I'm starting at verse 24. Now Thomas also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, the disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Let's pray together. Father God, as we turn now to your word, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and redeemer. And may you give us all ears to hear what you were saying to us through your living word. Amen. So this morning we're looking at John chapter 20, verse 24 to 31, and we're talking about doubting Thomas. A nickname that I feel is unfair and a mischaracterization of the disciple called Thomas. The first thing that we all think of when uh, in relationship to Thomas is this nickname, Doubting Thomas. Um, I was surprised that even if you look it up in the dictionary, so the Merriam-Webster dictionary has, you know, Doubting Thomas, an incredulous or habitually doubtful person. And then it refers to this passage that we're looking at today. Um, and, and it's not as if, you know, Thomas is the only disciple that ever doubted. Uh, in the Gospel of Matthew, right before Jesus uh, ascended and commissions his, he commissions his disciples, and he says, when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And that's in Matthew 28, verse 17. And so I found this comic that I think is, that expresses this problem well. Um, and so here you have Thomas saying, all I'm saying is that we don't call Peter denying Peter 
or Mark ran away naked, Mark, and if you're not sure what that reference is, just take a look at the Gospel of Mark, why should I be saddled with this title? And then the others say, I see your point, Thomas, but really, it's time to move on. And I believe that it's time for all of us to move on. And so this morning, I want to rehabilitate Thomas. Rather than remembering him as someone who expressed doubts or questions, I want to remember him as the one who uttered one of the greatest confessions in all of the Bible, whereupon seeing the resurrected Jesus, he cried out, My Lord and my God. Rather than commemorating him for a time of weakness, and, and even if we want to say that having doubts or questions is, is a weakness, uh, which we'll talk about more later, I want to set him apart as an example of faith. So rather than doubting Thomas, I propose we remember him as believing Thomas. Especially since this manner of remembering Thomas is exactly what the Apostle John wanted. The whole reason this story is placed here by John is because it uses Thomas's confession as an example of the type of believing faith that the gospel was intended to evoke. So in verses 30 and 31 of this chapter, it says, you know, John says that Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So all of the miraculous signs, all of everything that's in the Gospel of John, is especially the death and resurrection of Jesus, were written that we may believe in Jesus Christ, that Jesus is the Messiah, that he is the Son of God, and that by believing we may have life in his name. Just like Thomas ultimately believed. So then, all of this is to say that Thomas should be known ultimately for his magnificent confession of Christ, not his doubting. So let's look a little bit more at this disciple called Thomas. Uh, He's mentioned in, in, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and the other Gospels, as one of the twelve. Not much is said about him, uh, except for that he was there. Um, In the Gospel of John, we actually have a lot more information uh, about him, and we have three vignettes, or three sort of uh, stories about him, including the one that we're looking at this morning. And and also in the Gospel of John, we we find out that he's a twin. That's what Didymus means. Um, So he had a twin. We don't know who the twin was, and there's speculation about that. One thing that's actually quite interesting is is all the speculation and stories that surrounded Thomas uh, in antiquity. And so you have, you know, besides the Gospel of John, in addition, you know, later works, you have like a Gnostic Gospel of Thomas. You have an infancy Gospel of Thomas, an Apocalypse of Thomas, and and, uh, a book called the Acts of Thomas. And these books are all range from like the 2nd century to the 5th century A.D. And it's, it's interesting that in the Acts of Thomas, that's where we read the tradition that Thomas um, left and went to India, and where he you know, preaches the gospel, gives money to the poor, casts out demons, and, and finally is martyred. And that's where the Thomas church uh, in... Um, India draws their heritage from. So besides all, so there's, there's all this whole flurry of stories about Thomas uh, in the early church, but the ones in the Gospels, um, really it's the Gospel of John where we have more information. And so <clears throat> uh, one of the first places we meet Thomas uh, in the Gospel of John is in chapter 11 where Jesus wants to go to Bethany because Lazarus has died. Um, But his disciples try to dissuade him because it's dangerous, because people are looking for him um, and and want, and there's plots, you know, for Jesus' death. And at this point, Thomas uh, says, on behalf of the disciples, he says, uh, let us also go that we may die with him. 
And now it's hard to know how we should take this passage. Um, is this expressing resignation? You know, kind of like, you know, should we read this in the voice of Eeyore from Winnie the Pooh? Kind of like, oh, uh, yeah, let us go that we may die with him. And, you know, or what I think is better is he more speaking like Gimli, son of Glowen from Lord of the Rings, where he says, let us also go that we may die with him. You know, and, and so here I, I tend to take it this way, that here we get a glimpse of a brave Thomas. Uh, the next time we see Thomas uh, in the Gospel of John is in chapter 14, where Jesus comforts his disciples, and he mentions that he is going uh, away to prepare a place in his father's house and then come back for them. And, and of course, this confuses all of the disciples present. But Thomas is honest enough at this point to actually say, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Um, and, and this deserves special comment because here you have a man who's asking for directions, right? A man who doesn't know the way. Um, and, and so this is something which I think we should all note. And um, at any rate, the, the picture that emerges, emerges of Thomas from these couple passages is someone who's honest. Uh, he didn't pretend to know more than he do, did. Um, and in some ways, he maybe was, you know, slow to comprehend, but really all the disciples were. They were all struggling with the, what happened in these last few days. Um, and he also uh, is someone, though, who is willing to follow Jesus anywhere even to his own death. And so um, you see this picture, I think, is, is continued substantially in today's test, text. He's somewhat pessimistic, he's brash, but he's also upfront and honest. And, you know, and, and his comment there, he says, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my fingers where the nail, nails were and put my hand into his slide, I, side, I will not believe. Um, so Again, in the context of what's going on in the Gospel of John, like this last week, you know, this last time that since Jesus' crucifixion and, and his arrest and all of this stuff, that the disciples, they didn't know what to believe. They didn't know what to think. Um, and we, so we have to understand it and, and cut them some slack. And, and really, all Thomas is expressing here is that he wanted the same opportunity that the other disciples already had, right? In the previous, you know, few ver verses, Jesus, you know, appeared before the disciples when Thomas wasn't there, and he showed him his hands, and he showed him his side, and then they believed. And so he just wants that same um, opportunity. And so uh, what I find perhaps uh, the most amazing thing about this passage is that Jesus uh, did answer Thomas's request, right? That the Lord of the universe, the God Almighty, who, who, whose care extends to everyone, that he heard Thomas. And when Jesus appeared to Thomas, you know, he says, you know, see my hand, see my side, right? And he invites him to have that experience. And this just goes to show how much God cares for each single solitary one of us and how much he wants us to come to him with all of our doubts, our hurts, our concerns, no matter what we have. And this, this makes me think of 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, where it says, Cast all your anxiety upon the Lord, for He cares for you. That it doesn't matter what baggage, what questions, what issues we have, that, that Jesus invites us to bring them to Him. And, and as an aside, I want to mention, and I think this is very, very important, is that as a church, as a community of faith, we need to foster an atmosphere of love and acceptance and openness, openness so that we can feel free 
to share our doubts and our concerns with each other without a fear of rejection or reprisal. Um, and, and, and we want to be this place, this community, where people can be themselves and they don't have to wear the masks that we so often are, you know, are implicitly encouraged to wear uh, throughout our lives. So as it continues, at what Jesus' concession here moves to Thomas's confession. And at the sight of his master, alive and well, that Thomas was overwhelmed and uttered uh, a statement that Raymond Brown calls the supreme Christological statement of the fourth gospel. And one of the greatest confessions of the whole Bible. And he exclaims in the presence of Jesus and the disciples, my Lord and my God. And this at the very essence, is a confession of Jesus' divinity. Right? It's a confession that Jesus is, is also God. Um, and there's a couple things that, on the one hand, this, this confession is deeply theological. Right? That it makes explicit in the clearest terms the divinity of Jesus Christ. That he isn't just a good teacher or he isn't just a, a, a moral and a compelling speaker and rabbi, but that he is also the Son of God, that he's also co-equal with God um, and, and, and of the same essence and all this other sort of stuff that we talk about when we talk about the Trinity. So it's deeply theological. And, and that's not just like, so when he says, my Lord, so he's saying the, the word kurios, and, and this is a word that can be used in a variety of different ways in Scripture. It can mean, uh, you know, master, can mean uh, sir, even, in some contexts. But in this particular context, it's equated with Yahweh, the Lord Almighty, the God that's revealed in the Old Testament. And Yahweh, whenever it occurs in the Old Testament, it's translated by kurios. And one of the reasons why this seems very clear is the second part of his confession where he says, not just my Lord, but then he says, my God. And so together, <clears throat> it, it's, it expresses this, this deeply profound confession of the divinity of Jesus. This is exactly the same meaning that we find in another of, of John's writings in the book of Revelation where the words of the elders around the throne in chapter 4, verse 11, that they sing that you are worthy, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power. And it's significant that nobody previously addressed Jesus in this way in the Scriptures. It was a step of great faith and a profound revelation of who Jesus is. And nothing more profound could be said about Jesus than my Lord and my God. It's also a deeply personal, profoundly personal confession. And, and here it's the pronouns that make all the difference. And in Greek they're actually repeated there twice. So it's not just, you know, any Lord or any God, but it's my Lord, my God. And And... You know, that when we talk about faith, when we talk about belief, that it's not some detached sort of objective belief that we're talking about, but rather it's intensely personal. Biblical faith is always conceived as something which involves the whole person, not just what we think, but also what we feel and what we do. We're to love God with all of our hearts and with all of our minds, with all of our soul and with all of our strength. So the passage continues with Jesus pronouncing a beatitude in verse 29. And he says, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed.
Now, he's not contrasting seeing and believing, right? It's not uh, a seeing as a rebuke to Thomas in any ways. You know, when reality, all the first disciples, you know, Mary Magdalene and the others, that they all had the chance and the opportunity, and they all saw Jesus, the resurrected Jesus appeared among them. And so it's not this contrast, it's not a dig on Thomas or anything like that, but rather he's addressing uh, all of those of us who see, uh, who, who don't get the opportunity to see, but yet still believe. And so it, it's saying, happy are those who without having Thomas's experience share Thomas's faith. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 8 kind of puts it similarly when he says, Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you continue to believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. All of the miraculous signs, everything that's written about Jesus and John's gospel um, are written that you may believe or may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Something that's interesting about this passage, there's a very significant textual variant in verse 31 um, where, uh, and I, I represented it in my translation, that the question is whether or not it is uh, an aorist verb, may believe, that's just talking about belief in, in sort of without any reference to time, or if it's talking about that you may continue to believe. And the difference in the manuscripts is just one letter in Greek, uh, and actually the manuscript evidence in this case is, is pretty much equal. It's really hard to decide. The NIV in its translation has a footnote uh, that, invo- that includes the second translation uh, that you may continue to believe. Um, and I think that here, you know, again, you know, perhaps we should see that both of them uh, could be seen as valid and applicable. And so for those who do not yet know that Jesus uh, as personal Lord and Savior, that, that here it's kind of saying, consider making Thomas's confession your own, right? That you may believe. And so John wrote this book and told these stories about Jesus in order to elicit faith, belief in Jesus as the Son of God, the Messiah. But for many of us, we already believe. We've already had that moment and that time where we came to faith. Um, and, and for us who already believe then, then Thomas's confession is an encouragement to renew and to rekindle our own faith. And believing is not a once and for all action, but it's this ongoing activity. And this becomes clear in the next thing I want to just mention about this verb, that there's a second verb where he talks about by believing. That's where we have eternal life. Uh, And here it's in the present tense. And so it's the same verb used in all these different contexts. And, and this emphasizes that believing, especially in the Gospel of John, is not a one and done, right? It's not a once and for all action, but it's an ongoing activity in which we grow and deepen in throughout our lives. And so like when we share our testimonies, a lot of times we, we highlight that first time in our life where we, where we turn to Jesus, And we start following him. And that's great. That's amazing. Some of us are not even, you know, we're not even sure when that particular time is because we grew up in the church and in a home where the parents loved Jesus and you were exposed to it from infancy. And so it might be harder. But the point here of the Gospel of John is that whether or not you remember it or or not, is that hopefully when you're talking about it, it's just not something in the past but it's also something in the present that you continue to believe in that your faith is living and active and rich. Now, 
I do want to sort of, you know, say a little bit about faith and doubt. Because this is something which I, I think is, is important, and as I already indicated, that it's important that as a community of faith, uh, as families and all this, that we need to uh, allow people the space and the room to express honest doubts. So first in regards to believing faith, you know, we can't reduce faith to mere intellectual assent to propositions about God. Right? It includes, there's a, there is an intellectual component to faith, but that's not all it is. And I think in our post-enlightenment context that a lot of times that's how we tend to think. That, well, what I believe is, you know, I think this about Jesus and then that's all that matters. The other thing is significant is that nor can you equate faith with philosophical certainty. Right? That, that sometimes there is this, uh, among Christians, that there is this certainty that, no, that without a doubt I believe this, and this is solid and rock, you know, rock solid, you know, propositions about God. But, you know, like Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, for now we see only in a reflection as in a mirror, and then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know fully even as I am fully known. And so there's this sense that faith is faith. It's not certainty. And I'm not saying that we should be sort of tossed back and forth and, and not have sort of an assurance of our salvation or anything like that. But that faith is always open to sort of more uh, depth and more uh, detail as we progress in our life. And, and really... Faith, I think, the, the main part is that it's about an authentic relationship, right? The term pistis and pistuo, the verb for faith and believing in the New Testament, it can be translated as trust, as faithful obedience, as loyalty, allegiance. And one of the things that these words have in common is that they relate to a person, that it's not just something that's intellectual, or just a matter of our head, but it's also a matter of our heart. God is not a proposition. He is a person. And when you think of it, when, even how Jesus in the Gospel of John described it, he said that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He didn't say, I'm going to teach you what the way is. I'm going to teach you the truth. Or show you what the life is. No, rather he identified himself as the way, the truth, and the life. And so our faith, believing faith, is, is being in an authentic relationship with the living God as revealed in Jesus Christ. Now, when it comes uh, to doubt, I guess I want to, you know, uh, ask the question, like, do you think there's a place for honest doubt in faith? I believe there is. A couple of things that are important to know. First, is that doubt is not the opposite of belief. Unbelief is. And when we come to the idea of doubt, and, and here I'm relying on Anthony Thistleton, um, he is a, he's a leading New Testament scholar. He's done a whole lot of stuff in hermeneutics and how we understand and interpret the text. Um, he has a book, uh, Doubt, Faith, and Certainty. Uh, and in it, he highlights that doubt isn't always negative. And it's not always highlighted as negative in the Scriptures. But he says then, doubt then can function either negatively as a term that stands in contrast to trust, faith, or wholeheartedness, or positively as a term to denote self-criticism, humility, and careful reflection. And so when we come to talking about doubt and questions and, and the uncertainties that we may have in our faith, you know, I think that we need to have some humility and a recognition of the limits of human knowledge. You know, as Paul said in that First Corinthians passage, that we will never fully understand every aspect of our faith. 
but it's what we have has been revealed to us and what we do comprehend that that is what we're to respond to. And rather than seeing doubt as something wholly negative, something to be ashamed of, that your faith is somehow deficient, I would argue that doubt may provide a path to authentic belief. That when you look at this, this example from this passage, that's exactly how it would function for Thomas. You know, that, that he was brash and he did sort of talk about, you know, putting his, he needed to put his hand uh, or his fingers in Jesus' hand and in his side and all this sort of stuff. But when, when it comes right down to it, once he saw Jesus, he believed. And it led to an authentic, deep, and robust faith. So, Doubt itself isn't problematic, but really it's more what we do with it, right? It's how we respond to it that I think is the important question. Um, William Hamilton uh, is known to have said, we doubt in order that we may believe. You know, I think of the, f- the faith of the centur- centurion, um, right, who exclaimed, you know, like, you know, help me in my unbelief. Right? And I think um, this is just almost the flip side of uh, another phrase that, or another saying that we're probably familiar with from Anselm, uh, faith-seeking understanding. Right? That our faith isn't something that's just stagnant, but it's something that we continue to grow in, and, and questions will come up throughout our life, throughout as we're walking with Jesus. The questions will come up that we'll explore and answer uh, and, and this is sort of one of the benefits of the community of faith. Because when we, when we follow Jesus, we follow Jesus together. And we have that ability to be able to you know, ask and answer and to you know, share experiences with one another. Alistair McGrath, he has this little book, and he's a, another leading evangelical theologian, a British guy, um, <clears throat> and he has this book, Doubt, Handling It Honestly. And this is what he says. He says, doubt is probably a permanent feature of the Christian life. It's like some kind of spiritual growing pain. Sometimes it recedes into the background. At other times it comes to the fore, making its presence felt with a vengeance. And I know that even in my own life, And as I follow Jesus now for, I don't know, like 35 years or something like that, that there's been times where I doubted. There's been times where I had significant questions. But then there's been times where I haven't. And I think if any of us are honest with ourselves, that we realize that that's the sort of journey that we're all on. And Alistair McGrath is highlighting and saying that, yeah, this is part of what it means to be a Christ follower. That there's going to be times when you have questions. And, and quite frankly, I imagine that right now during this time of COVID, you know, that, that people are having questions about, you know, like how is God involved in this? What's going on? You know, and, and we're seeing the, the death toll mount and rise, and we say, well, how is God working in this world? And those are profound questions that we have to be able to ask, and we have to be able to look for answers for with the realization that maybe we will never find an answer that's totally satisfying. One of the other things that, when we talk about doubt, that I think is important, is to realize that I think there's an element that this is a generational issue. right? That there is some difference between the generations. Um, And John Seal, uh, in, in this interesting study done of the cultural frame shift that's underway in our culture, right? That this is what he says. He says, institutions that assume true faith and correct thinking are two sides of the same coin are not safe places to express doubt. When belief and doubt are binary rather than a fused experience, the stakes are too high to be honest about doubt. The church is not a safe place to voice confusion. 
Consequently, many independent thinking teens keep these doubts and disenchantments bottled up until college. And then he goes on and he sure shows how and many of them are leaving the church because their questions are never even entertained. And so I think that, you know, this is something which you can say to like the parents, that, you know, your home needs to be a place where those questions and those doubts can be expressed without fear of reprisal, that you can talk openly about them with your children. And then as a church, as I've already said, we need to be a place where we can foster this atmosphere of love and openness as well so that your kids can find those answers and that we can all continue to follow Jesus and, and to sort of grow in our understanding and in our faith. So in conclusion, I just want to emphasize here that Jesus invites us into authentic relationship, into a believing personal faith in himself. He came to Thomas and met with him where he was. He didn't say, oh, Thomas, come on, you're stupid. You don't need to, you know, you don't need to see. Why can't you believe like all the other disciples? But no, he came to him. And I am convinced that if we come to God, if we come to Jesus with that same honest questions and that openness, that he will meet us as where we are as well. And perhaps an analogy, you know, might be uh, appropriate here, that, that, you know, with a love relationship, that when you think of it, let's say you're at a boring, you're on a boring Zoom meeting, right, and, and you're, you know, but you notice this, this person in the, the, the picture in the bottom right-hand corner, and that person piques your interest and you're drawn to them. Uh, and then when we're done all this COVID stuff that, that you actually want to meet them. And as you meet them, at some point in that relationship, you're going to have to decide, do you stay guarded? Do you, do you share more? Um, and, and, and that's what falling in love is, right? That's what we refer to as falling in love. And, and, and at some point, you're going to have to take a risk in that relationship and to open up yourself to the other person. And I would like to argue that it's really, it's, it's very similar with God. That we might have doubts, we might have things that we're not ready to share, that we're not sure of. But I encourage you to take that risk. You know, take that risk on God and, and give Him a try. Bring your hopes and your doubts and your anxieties to God. And, and trust in Him. And as it concludes in this passage, it says, Blessed are those who have not seen and have yet believed. That God will bless you. And this, and, it, and quite frankly, I'd say it's, it would be the best decision that you have ever made in your life to start following Jesus. Now, we've talked a lot about faith as, as relationship. But I do want to say that there is also an intellectual component. There is a, a content to our faith uh, that has been reflected on over the last couple thousand years of, of Christianity. And, and I thought it would be good to end this morning. See, we're talking about belief. We're talking about our response to the resurrection appearances of Jesus. That it would be good to recite the Apostles' Creed together. This is part of who we are at Greenfield, that the Apostles' Creed is one of the components of the content of our faith. Um, and I encourage you to, to read it aloud with me, uh, whether you're by yourself watching this, whether you're with family members, uh, or through other, with others through Zoom. But let's recite it together.
I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried, and descended to the dead. And on the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And, and now, because I think we want to engage not only our heads, but also our hearts, Scott is going to lead us in singing the Apostles' Creed. <laughs> 